Whitman looks at the life of actress Jessie Matthews in Catch a Fallen Star. All right, darling. Have a good day. <laughs> well, a good morning, anyway. <laughs> there won't be much of it. No. By the time I've packed my few things together, they'll be passing around the glasses. You did say it was 12 o'clock, didn't you? Yes, at least those are my orders from Miss Harvey. You're sure you'll be able to make it? Of course, darling. I wouldn't miss your send-off for the world. They'll all be very busy. The day the BBC finally killed off Mrs. Dale, the radio soap queen, and her diary marked the end of another episode in the real-life drama of Jessie Matthews the actress who specialized in putting on a brave face. I'm glad I put a little mascara on my eyelashes to prevent myself from crying. It's very sad, really. How long have you been in this? Uh, six years, six years and a couple of months. Have you become Mrs. Dale? No, no, I'm afraid not. She's a very lovable, warm-hearted character. I like to think I am warm, but uh, I don't think I'm as good as Mary. Basically, you see, Jessie was an open-hearted, uh, a generous uh, disposition, but bedeviled all her life by a most complicated set of nervous disorders, which nearly wrecked her career on several occasions, and resulted in the loss of friends and all society. She would change in front of you um, into a different person with whom you just could not communicate. There were, no, there were no lines of communication left. It wasn't Jessie's fault. She was just unwell. Would you uh, go through it all again, the show business career? No, I mean? not for all the tea in China. Not for all the tea in China. You would not go on the stage? No, no, no. Definitely no. When you're young, it's always spring, and life is a happy song. How we laugh at care. And sing as we roll along. Though the years go rushing by, and spring is a memory, life will always be the same sweet song to me. When you've got a little spring time in I came here, what, over 42 years ago, when this was going through a studio. This particular studio, Lime Grove, what is called Lime Grove, this is where Jessie did most of her big musicals. And, of course, arriving here is always a rather extraordinary feeling, because of all the ghosts that have gone before. stars we ever had. What is so extraordinary is that the majority of people today only think vaguely of somebody who was Mrs. Dale. It's something to do with a diary. She's a far greater dancer than Ginger Rogers. Much, much better. And I thought a better actress. But she's rather forgotten, I'm afraid. And the 
there isn't a plaque up to her. I think there's a plaque up to Jesse Matthews anyway. I don't think you, you can even find a gravestone. It's an oblivion entire. Jessie would have loved it here. Oh, she would. Yes. Florence, I so wonder, how do you remember where Jessie is? Well, it, it is it's sort of diagonal to someone with my Christian I name. See. I see. Have a look yes, at yes. Two fans and friends of Jessie Matthews visit her unidentified grave. Oh. I have to look for Florence Bray and then think of some of these in you. Where are we? even thought the poorest people in life have something um, somebody put no, something up to say of... well they're resting here but there's nothing at all which is very sad yes i i well i say jesse's m memorial is uh, is the films that you people have in your cans that's her memorial you can get them out any time and uh, and show them i think that's more of just put a bit of stone up or anything like that. It's only a few people know about it. No, I think she's got a memorial already. I can't find her. Is she? Here we are. There she is. There we are. Yes. 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 That is how I know. It's this plot here along. There, really. Mm -hmm. yes. 50 odd years ago, a star was born. The evergreen Jesse Matthews, this is your life. Before or since, in England, America, or anywhere, there's never been anyone quite the same. Jesse Matthews, who sang and danced her way from the back streets of Soho onto the front pages of the world. Over my shoulder goes one care. Over my shoulder goes two care. Why should I cry to a I'm free at heart and I'm in love. Over my shoulder goes three care. Over my shoulder goes four care. Bye bye. Glamour. But there wasn't very much glamour about the world that you were born into. No. Come in there, stand your army. Free red band, fresh every day. Five more packs, Jervis. All refreshed every day. The great, incomparable C.B. Cochran. Now, if anyone had a knife or the germ of genius, it was he. In 1921, he writes, I was auditioning at the Palace Theatre when there came on stage a most interesting-looking child called Jesse Matthews. She had enormous eyes, the funniest little nose, was wearing clothes that seemed too large for her and held in both hands a huge umbrella. She sang a little song and danced a little dance and was as attractive as could be. <laughs> and Cochrane's wasn't the only eye you caught, as we can see and hear. Behind you now, some of the grind and some of the grief, the endless practicing, the trudging from agent to agent, striving to bury the Cockney accent that you've been brought up with. I'm never quite sure whether she was proud of having come from what they call nowhere, or a bit ashamed of, 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 of humble origins. It was a funny, there was a, a mixture of the two attitudes in it. In, in one way, she was, she would say, I used to dance that day at market on my father's fruit stall or something like that. At another time, she would, uh, a little bit come the Duchess. You know, slightly plummy and, uh, oh no, they exaggerate all that. You know, they've got a bit of both. Jessie lived down there over the stables that her father had, and it wasn't very nice. It used to smell the urine from the horses now and again as you were up there in the kitchen. Well, it was, it was just a one living room. Wasn't no kitchen, sitting room, nothing. It was just a living room. Did you think that Jessie Matthews would be a star? No way. For one thing, I thought perhaps the family wouldn't be able to afford it, and the conditions that she was living in, and things like that. I mean, you know, it didn't. It didn't seem possible that, looking back on it now, that she could have got so far for the little that she had. It was only sheer work and. 
really hard work for her, actually. It really was. And then, of course, she had that opportunity to go to uh, America in the chorus, and she came back a star. So if you I always knew my name was going to be up there in lights when I didn't know, but I knew. This used to cause an awful lot of atmosphere with the other chorus girls, because if they were at all unpleasant to me, I used to say, you're being very stupid, you know, because one day I'm going to be a star. She was born in Soho with a broad Cockney accent, but she did uh, take elocution lessons and to, to get the vowels right, but she went over the top instead of a normal voice. It was too terribly posh, or what we used to call cut glass. <laughs> and um, a lot of people impersonated her, you know, in um, her number over my shoulder, there was one care, you know, they would put up the nose like there were two fingers and say, oh, my shoulder goes one care. And that was how she used to do it. <laughs> And she still stayed like that till, till the end of her days. She was a superstar. Uh, but she never had happiness. I don't think she was really happy. I think she would have given it all up for a happy married life and have children of her own. I think she would have given all her stardom up for that. Honestly? I mm -hmm. do, yes. There's two ways about it. Do you think that's true, Doris? Well, that's what she told me in the latter years, you know. She said, well, looking back, I've had fame, fortune, I've been to places, I've met kings and queens. But when I think back, she said, and look at how happy the family is with their children and grandchildren around them, mm -hmm. I would have loved that type of happiness. The silver lining, red ever close, Jessie married three times and divorced three times. Her second husband, and the best known, was the musical comedy star Sonny Hale. Ironically, while she tarted up her vowels, Sonny, who came from a classy background, often found himself cast as a cockney. You drop this, miss. Oh, thank you. Mm. You won't forget to put me off at Linden Gardens, will you? No fear, miss. We mustn't keep auntie waiting, must we? Any more fares, please? She had a great capacity for marrying the wrong man. She had a genius for marrying the wrong man. Poor they're all so bloody to her. Forgive me. They behaved very badly to her. I thought. But I don't want the impression to, to emerge from what you're saying, Polly, that she was an unhappy person. She wasn't. She looked poorly, though. No, well, she was physically unwell a well, good deal of the time. Well, because doctors messed her about. She lived on her nerves a great deal. Well, let me, all of us do, do anything but, in But uh, she, she, she was very fulfilled in her work in Well, about that's the only thing she was fulfilled in, really. In the early 30s, Jessie hired a young Cambridge graduate to teach one of her brothers to be a gent. Frederick Jones, now Lord Elwyn Jones, later became Lord High Chancellor and protector of Jessie Matthews. She enjoyed enormously the work of an actress and did it superbly well. So I, I don't want an image to, to come of, 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 a, of a public figure living in a private state of depression. She was a very nervous person, very nervy person, but this, that's not the impression she's left on me, Polly. But you're different, sir. Well, of course we are. Um, she was very at ease with you. I didn't like to see this lovely girl. Lovely beyond words. No, a dream, a dream. Lovely, she gave us the impression of such beauty and floating about the place. Oh, she was a wonderful oh, dancer. We thought she didn't sing so well, but not that it mattered. But uh, I think she was a very emotional person, and uh, none of her marriages worked. They were all disastrous. And her great joy, obviously, her real life, was with the audience, with the gallery, with the people who loved her, as it always is, you know, in cases like this. They very often, their private lives are impossible uh, but uh, they they get their love from the audience and that's where they belong right let's go one